Hi, this is Adrian with PowerCode, and in today's training, we're going to go through PowerCode's ticketing system. So you'll see right here from the home screen, there's a widget that shows how many active and waiting tickets are assigned to this user, in this case, Warren Bono's account. And you can either click right here to go into the ticket module, or you can use this dark gray universal navigation bar at the top and click here to get to tickets, or from an individual customer's accounts, you can do that as well. Uh, you can see that from the light gray tab that says tickets, we'll see all tickets that have ever been associated with this customer. This is important because the ticketing module itself only shows active, resolved, and waiting tickets, whereas we see there's a few closed out tickets here we can dig into if we need to. From there, we'll go ahead and click into the ticketing module. Now you'll see on the left hand side here, power code is designed so you can task your first responder employees, your CSRs, your uh, phone service techs, anyone that answers a call to actually work right from their ticketing system all day long and basically let that task where they're going with their day. And basically be more efficient by making sure they're getting to everything from the system right here. To get a better grasp of it, let's go ahead and open a ticket. We can apply a template. In this case, there are none, but this would just fill any preset uh, information into this problem field here. So maybe for specific types of issues, you wanna make sure you're gathering information and reminding your employees to do so. You can select that it's an individual, general, or network site, and then apply it to whoever you would like to. Let's go ahead and put this on Revolver's account. And we can say, set the firm address, we'll mess with that later. We can create a summary for the ticket. Call this can't connect. Typically you'd have more in this field, but for this example, we're just gonna put that there. We're gonna have it assigned to myself. And this is a tier one support ticket. Now this is where you can start to see how the organization of power code tickets comes to light. We have our responsibilities area, which would be defined as whoever is actually accountable for moving that ticket to the next phase in the process or resolving it. Then there's a classification section down here, which represents the actual nature of the ticket. With that, we have a category and type. The type is dependent on the categories you select. So if you select the billing category, you only have these types that are billing related. But if we go down into support, we can see we have some more. These are all fully customizable. I suggest you actually have a lot more than just these here. Uh, the more you have, the more granular you can get on your reporting and start to notice trends and issues. Uh, but we'll look at that as soon as we're done with the whole ticketing piece and how to actually configure it. So we'll go here and choose no internet and then submit the ticket. So then again on the left here, I'm going to close this my tickets. We can see that we have groups and categories. Again, these groups are going to be the organizational departments within your company. When you're actually building out these areas, I highly suggest you put department on the other side of it. So you can keep it straight from your categories, which oftentimes are named very similarly. Now you might ask, why have it split up like this? Why not just have one for everything? You certainly can do that if you want when you set it up, but the reason behind it is, as managers, you are able to see in your department, for instance, if I was responsible for the customer care department, how many tickets they're currently working on, as well as how many issues are relevant to that department that uh, need to be moved to the next level. So you can see for customer care, we have five tickets in our group, but only four tickets in our category. Well, why is that? Well, we can take a look here and dive in and say, huh, there's a slow speeds ticket here. Why would that be? Well, we see it came in from the support department and ah, okay. They thought they were having an issue, but they were actually just maxing out their connection. So this got bumped over to the customer care department to upsell them on. This is also pretty obvious in the infrastructure department, where if we look at the actual issues, there's only one, which would make sense. There is a, oh, it looks like a tower climb realign, but if we go and see what they're responsible for working on right now, oh, we have a couple sales tickets that actually went over because they wanted to see if we could do a dedicated point to point. So from there, we can now see where these My Tickets comes in handy. This again is where I would suggest you workflow all of your employees who are using the phone. They can see any of the tickets that don't have a user associated with it, which probably means they need to be touched. Any tickets that are currently in their name, which they're solely responsible for moving, um, as well as any in their different groups. And you can assign a user to you know one, none, or multiple groups. 
You can also uh, see anything that's being watched, watching group, and follow up here. Now there's four different ways to open tickets within PowerCode. We can go into the module like we did here and click that create a ticket button. We can also go up here and jump into the customer account. And this is probably the most traditional way where a customer calls in, you look them up in the system, pull up their information, and then from their account overview page, you can scroll on down, see some of the tickets they have open. You can click add right here. You can also escalate a ticket from a call log. Now we should talk about call logs real quick here. There's three real informational categories within Power Code. There's a ticketing piece, which we've been looking at. There's also the notes section right here. Um, the recommendation is anything that is a life of the account type issue, such like in this example, uh, there's a copyright infringement, maybe there's a door code, maybe there's an aggressive dog, anything that can, should kind of just be at that top level visible for the customer. Um, another suggestion is we have customers that will actually put color codes on the type of customer they have. So a gold customer might be someone who's very influential in the community, maybe the mayor, CEO of the power company, something like that. Whereas a silver customer might be someone that's a little more difficult to handle. Uh, it's kind of helpful going in knowing that someone might have their hackles up as soon as you answer the phone. So that's a great place to stash that note. The next level is call logs. You can click on this plus right here to start a call log. You can choose the contact that's calling in and then it brings us to this little window right here. Now, customers that do use call logs, I would say this is a widely used feature, but it can be handy. Uh, really, most of the communication should go into tickets uh, if it's a specific issue, um, but this would be a great place for someone called in and made their payment or changed their credit card number. Uh, again, can be used, doesn't have to be used. Tickets would be the superior way to capture most of your information, but you do see you can escalate to a ticket down here as well. And then, of course, click here to add a ticket. Now, the customer can also open their own tickets. From their customer portal, we'll take a look at right here, they can go to Contact Us. And from here, they can open a new ticket, put this in, hit Submit. They can also see the back and forth from their tickets they've had. See, the customer started here. There was a response back by the company. And they're saying, oh, we'll try the work number. But we do know that it's pretty rare for customers to go log in and actually open a ticket itself. So the most eloquent way for customers to get tickets into their system is through their email. So we assume that most power code customers of ours, our ISPs, are going to have a support at yourdomain.com, maybe a billing at your domain, probably even a sales at, maybe a couple others. Well, we can link all of those email addresses to actually automatically open a ticket directly within power code. Now what's really cool about that is that eliminates the issue where you have that distribution list where a ticket comes in and everyone gets the same email and maybe two or three people are working on it at the same time and then they're doubling up their efforts. Or even worse, nobody's looked at the email and it's just sitting there untouched. Or same thing if they have to log into another email box to get that, they're probably not right on top of those issues. So with this system, it automatically builds a ticket. It would set it to an unclaimed status. And then again, your employees come in, they look at the unclaimed tickets, they pull it up here, assign it to themselves so everyone else knows not to work that ticket. Then they work it to the next step and then put it back to waiting or active or close it out if they're done with it. And what that actually looks like is that same ticket from the customer portal we can see on this side. And what's great about that is right here from this button, your employees can also reply directly back to the customer and that will both send an email and log to their customer portal. They can also choose the address it's coming from. So that way, instead of in your traditional system, they're sending it from their own email and then the customer, excuse me, the subscriber replies and comes back to their email and then no one else sees it. And if they're on vacation for a couple of days, then it just sits there. This way it's always going right back into the main system where anyone can jump in and take it and move it to the next step. And setting up this email connection is also something we'll take a look at at the end of this video here. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a ticket itself. We'll see right here at the top that it's active. We have four different statuses, active, waiting, resolved. You can filter by each up here. Again, close is a status a ticket can be placed into, but then it's not viewable within this dashboard. So you can choose never to close tickets if you'd like. We also have a feature where resolved tickets automatically get closed after a certain set of time. That's to keep this ticketing portal fast, snappy, working properly, because as you grow, you get thousands and thousands of tickets. So we close those out and keep them directly on the customer account. 
now we see that this is a customer viewable ticket here which means any responses that go on this reply will again be emailed back to the customer as well as logged to their customer portal. Now, what about if you need to move it back and forth within your company so you don't want the customer actually seeing that information? Uh, you know, maybe you're saying, hey, Phil, take a look at this. I don't know what to do about it, something like that. That goes right here in this comment section. So anything that goes in comments is not customer viewable at any point. You can also transfer a ticket between users or unassign a user from a ticket as well or to a different group. So this would be where you're bouncing it out to another department for them to take care of it. From the Actions tab, there's a lot here. We could change the summary if we needed to. Status can also be changed from here as well as from the Update Reply button. We can set an urgent flag. Now that can either be a urgent flag on off or you can set a number one through five or 10. We'll look at that on the configuration side as well. You can choose a follow-up date when selected an email will be kicked to whoever's responsible for it to take a look at it. We see the category type. We also see an option to have a parent-child ticket. So the parent-child ticketing is pretty neat. Let's take a look at that infrastructure ticket we had over here. Well, this is a tower climb realign that needs to happen. And we see that it seems like it was connected to the windstorm. It's important to note that our ticketing system also accepts hotlinks. So this is a copy paste from an actual piece of equipment. If we clicked it, it would take us right to that equipment. But we can see that they need to go up and actually repoint that antenna. Well, it's probably not going to happen right away. So what happens is you can set children to the ticket. So that means these other tickets here, we'll see oh, that almost unusable last night. Looks like that was probably also connected to the same windstorm. We'll go all the way down here. Hey, look at that. It appears to be connected to the same issue. So that way when someone goes out and does that tower climb, they can go right down the children tickets and fire off responses letting everyone know it should be fixed and better. You can also, from this related ticket, see any of the siblings that are associated with the issue as well. So from here we see uh, this one was not open from the customer portal. That again from this actions can be toggled on and off right here. You can also create a job from a ticket by clicking this, but because this is not customer viewable, that means even stuff in this update tab here will not go to the customer. That will just sit here unless the customer viewable is turned on. And from here you can also choose the status of the ticket. Uh, some rule of thumbs on that are it's active if someone from your company still needs to do something with it. Waiting is a good place to put it if it's in the customer's court. Maybe they need to go reset the router, maybe they need to go buy a new router and give you the Mac. Maybe they called in there at work and they can't really troubleshoot it, so you want to keep that ticket open but put it in waiting. And then resolve would be when it's done. So next to the actions button we have the watchers. This is a great way to make sure you're keeping tabs on a ticket, especially if it's important to you. So you might hand it off to an employee of yours, but you want to keep tabs on it and make sure it's getting taken care of. Set yourself or anyone else in the company for that matter to a watcher. At related tickets we already looked at, we have the parent and siblings here. History will show any other tickets that are on this account. And then files, you can upload files, pictures, whatever you might need. You can also filter by the type of entry over on this side and only see the pieces you're looking for if you get some pretty long threads in there. Of course, we have the ID of the ticket. If there's a parent, the customer account it's on, email if it came in from an email, who's responsible for working it at that time. Now we get into the idle duration. This is very, very handy to keep on top of your issues. We see from a window here, we can sort by summary or idle time or follow up. Again, most of our customers as they flow their employees, it's always sort by this idle time. You wanna make sure you're taking care of the oldest tickets first. Well, the duration is going to be the total length of the ticket open. So that's just gonna show you how long that ticket's been open until it's closed. The idle time can be determined by you guys as far as when you want that to reset to zero. So there are two options. One option is every time the ticket is touched or something's done, there's a comment, there's a transfer, anything's done on it, that clock resets back to zero. The other option is only when the update and reply button is used. The reason for that is sometimes you might be working on it internally and it might get, this ticket might get touched five times in a day or you know 10 times in a week. But unless the customer knows you're working on it, they're still gonna get frustrated. 
So rule of thumb, in my opinion, is to keep that where it's only reset when there's an update reply. So you could still be working it back and forth at your company, but you know, every couple days, you probably should reach out to the customer in some form and let them know that you're still working on it, you're close to a solution, you need more information or whatever it might be. And the last piece of the ticket itself are these on-the-fly tags. If we haven't given you enough ways to categorize and keep track of things, we give you more. These right here can be literally anything you want to put in here. You can, for whatever reason, say Tuesday, if you felt like it. And as you type, you're going to see the different options available that we currently have in there. So if there is a tag, you can utilize one of those. And these tags live right down here at the very bottom of our left hand column. So we see we can click in and go to the ones we need to, or if I put in Tuesday here, then it adds the flag Tuesday and it just dropped it right down here as well. And up in this area, you'll be able to see some of the tags that are associated with them. So again, if you want to keep track of all those tickets uh, that came in as a result of the windstorm, you could click on that there as long as you guys are entering the right tags in. It is important to note that from this action tab, in addition to sending an email when that follow-up occurs, it sorts it in this column on the right here. So you can sort by follow-up, you can sort by whether or not it's urgent or the urgency level too. Now let's look at going in and actually setting up the ticketing system. So from there, go over to the config tab and down to tickets. We're going to start with this blacklist here. This is for when you have your email established. Uh, you want to make sure that no emails from these domains create tickets. That would be a great one for your own domain or anyone else that might be emailing into you where you don't want those to generate tickets. Uh, maybe you have some type of paging software that automatically generates tickets. All that should be stashed right here. Next, we're going to go back up to config and tickets and look at how we actually configure them. Now from here, we have the general settings. I mentioned we can use an urgency flag or set priority levels and how many you want. And then what the default priority level is when a ticket's first opened. So if you wanted those, I would suggest this would actually be probably three, keep it medium and people can put it higher or lower. Whether or not you want to automatically close resolve tickets and then how many days after that ticket is set to resolve for it to close. You can also set it where you can determine which users are allowed to close tickets. So you can set this to no meaning people can only resolve it except for a handful of individuals that can be set up from the permissions area. Then we have whether or not you're resetting that idle clock like we talked about versus only replies, which would be that one tab that goes back to the customer or update, or whether or not we want basically everything down here. You can choose to auto reassign ticket on update. Uh, there is a way if you want for every single time a ticket's touched, it will automatically put it in your name as the user. I advise against that. It gets kind of confusing, especially if you go in and help someone else by putting a note there, or if you transfer it to another department, it will still keep you as the user. And then whether or not you want to include the entire ticket history in the email. So this is an instance where when you use that reply button and it's set to customer viewable, do you only want to send the message you're typing now, or do you also want to send the thread of other replies? Again, in this instance, it still would not send the comments. It would only send the replies. From there, we can create our groups or our departments. Pretty simple and straightforward. You just type it in here, hit add group. And then once it's added, you can go in and decide which users are part of each group. In this case, you only have one, but if we want to put someone else in there, we could just go like that and drop them right in. And we have our categories, which again are kind of top level uh, nature of the issue type organizational pieces, and then the types. And again, with the types, you need to type in the type here and then select the category you want to associate it to. From there, we can go in and look at look at setting up your support accounts. This is where you go in and just enter all the information relevant to your email. So put your address, username, password, then you decide which category you want it to go to. So again, this is handy for, you know, you're probably going to have your billing at your company.com tickets go to a billing category, not your support category. Or if you want, we do have some that create a category itself that's just inbound emails and they have one employee who's responsible for delegating those out. I prefer the method of just making sure that you put it to the department that's gonna be working on it, which again, you can do by individual email. You can also choose a user in a group. 
Um, I again recommend not selecting a user automatically unless there's one very specific email address people are emailing to that's only going to go to that person. And then you type port and whether or not it's SSL and you are off to the races. Lastly, we'll look at our ticket templates and that's at the very bottom here in tickets. And you just click here to add a new one, call it what you want. You can select whether or not it's individual, general, or network, put it in here, and then whether or not it automatically is going to assign these criteria at the bottom to it. So that's how ticketing works within PowerCode. As always, if you have any other questions or you need some more guidance, feel free to reach out at support at powercode.com or 920-351-1010. Thanks so much.